And then on that note, I've greeted everybody. I don't want to... Chair, we lost you. Am I not audible? Yeah, you are back online now, Chair. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying we have to start exactly at the time that we have really set up. So uh, I think also the chair is here of the men's forum. Uh, they will really take us through. Let's make sure that we start. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Ch uh, Deputy Chairperson of Chairpersons, uh, Honourable Members, Chairpersons of Committees, I see, and Tate Sokaile, I see, Tate Matafeni, um, Honourable Members who have joined us, um, officials, our invited uh, guests, the, the Deputy uh, Chairperson of the uh, gender Commission, Commissioner Ntate, Sediko Rakolete, um, and, and all our invited guests. I'm not sure if ever, um, uh, 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 if ever we've been able to connect all the other guests that we would have invited uh, in this session so that we can promptly start at the time that we said we were going to start at. Uh, I have not, I'm not sure if ever we've been able to get in that day, Mashaba. I'm not sure if ever we've been able to get all the other um, invited guests that are here. I see um, um, uh, the uh, uh, many Nimoya is here. I'm not sure about the other in invited guests so that we can promptly start uh, because we had said we'll start at six o'clock. Uh, Fezile. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Chair. Um, I do not see uh, Mr. Mashaba on the uh, people we have connected. We'll just have to follow up with him. Uh, but uh, our host... He's here, uh, he's here. GF, um, oh, he's here. Okay, I apologize. Um, okay, then uh, we can start. Maybe, colleagues, um, my name is Colin Hans. I should be facilitating the whole program. I can see on my list that everybody is on the right side of my channel. I can see who's active and who's not active. I think, like we we said, we should uh, start the program at this point. And maybe I should just say, certainly this gives me an avalanche and the most inestimable pleasure for me to officiate a program of such dynastic nature. As we know that uh, this is the the... Houghton Provincial Legislature Men's Forum that is hosting now the visual gender-based violence seminar in partnership with Josie FM, which is today under the theme Banna Aribue. So I just want to acknowledge everybody. And uh, as we said, Maban Hore will do things accordingly. Maybe it's important that uh, we should look at all issues uh, starting now. We know for the fact that gender-based violence occurs as a result of uh, normative role, expectations, and unequal power relationships between genders in a society. And the expectations associated with different genders vary from society to society and over time. So we know that uh, the, the Houghton Provincial Legislature has been spearheading this program with the support of many stakeholders, in particular, in different spheres, we got NGOs, faith-based organizations that are always uh, up in arms with the issues, and also the, 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 the lawmakers, in particular guys who are sitting in the legislature. So many other issues, between 25% and 40% of South African women have experienced sexual and uh, physical IBV in their lifetime. Just under 50% of women reports having ever experienced emotional and economical abuse at the hands of the intimate partners in their lifetime. 
So I think chair of chess will will set the, the the whole platform in motion, and maybe I should ask uh, chair of chess to 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 help us kickstart the whole motion. No, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, for the opening, I'll give it to the chair of um, the men's forum. Uh, I'm on the item. So the chairperson of the men's forum will make sure that he opens the session. And uh, Dima Kovela. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Colin Hans, um, um, our host for this evening, and welcome to all our invited guests, uh, chair, chairperson of chairpersons of committees, deputy uh, uh, chairpersons of chairpersons, and and everybody who's following us on all the social uh, media networks, YouTube, Facebook, who are streaming live with us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to check if uh, the officials will then be able to to send out the link to everybody who's who who are trying because we are we are getting messages that there are those who would want to to follow our discussions. Um, um, briefly, uh, we we believe that in a time where we should be focusing on growing the economy and nourishing the South Africa we want to see. Women are ev every day ravaged not only by troubled challenges of inequality, poverty, and unemployment, but also are being made to, to be thankful of every minute they take to breathe. Because at any given time, they can, that breath can be taken for the last time. We fought and defeated apartheid. What is stopping us from defeating patriarchy? We have come to a time where we cannot afford to be neutral. We as men must come to choose to be soldiers that are fighting for the freedom of our women and children, because if not, then we are soldiers that are betraying the fight for freedom. President Oliver Tambo, the longest serving president of the African National Congress said in one of the, general, the January 8th statements of the ANC, and I quote, that the struggle of women must be fought relentlessly by men, close quote. It is clear that it must be us because women are, are victims of, of the violence of men. And it must be us that begin to, to turn the tables around and to fight this battle. Clearly, uh, existing legislation has failed to address gender-based violence in our country. And we need to also, we, we need to, in this discussion, come up with legis proposed legislations that can be strong enough to be able to combat the demon of racism. In South Africa, we know um, uh, uh, that the problem of gender-based uh, violence is more severe. We are a country with relatively high levels of violence and criminality. Slightly more than 20,000 people were killed in 2017 last year, and the majority of the perpetrators of those, uh, uh, of those victims were men. The most recent data from the World Health Organization shows that South Africa femicide was 12.1% was in 2016. This was almost five times higher than the global average. According to the SAPS crime statistics report of 2019, femicides increased by 11% over the last two years. Stat SA reports that the 138% 138 per 100 uh, uh, women were raped last year, the highest in the world. We cannot and will not rest until we have brought those figures down. So it is very clear that the uh, uh, women in our country, in South Africa, they are endangered species. We are the highest in them. We said this in the last time when we met in our meeting, internal meeting before, before this session. We, are the high, we have the highest uh, rape stats in the country. We have the highest femicide stats in the country. Women are murdered every day in our country. A woman is raped every hour in our country. And, and we are high on, on, on all those. It says something. It means that we need to, to abandon the, uh, the current legislation 
and come up with legislation that can be able to address this case. It was Thomas Sankara who said, and I quote, uh, comrades, there is no true social revolution without the liberation of women. May my eyes never see and may my feet never take me to a society where half the people are held in silence. I hear the roar of women's silence. I sense the ramble of their storm and I feel the fury of their revolt through school. On this day, I'm nothing, and all, all of us who are here are nothing but a, a conduit and, a, and an amplifier of the roar of the silence of women, the ramble of their storm and the fury of their revolt. We must become the mouthpiece of their, of their pain and suffering. It was Fatim, Fatima Havji, an Egyptian women's rights activist who wrote, and I quote, history tells us that women stand side by side with men fight with men, get killed defending themselves and others along with men, and then nest the wounded, lament the dead, and chant and dance when the struggle is victorious, and help to manage the aftermath when it, when it is not. However, history also indicates that after the success of a political struggle or after a revolution, women are often, too, are often forced to go back to their traditional gender roles, and do not benefit from the harvest of the revolution, Bruce Code. We just want to hope uh, in this uh, short remarks that the, our invited guests who are specialists in some of who are doing work in the fight against uh, gender-based violence will be able to, to equip us with information that will empower us as legislators that will take to the, to the legislature propose legislation that can be able to fight, to fight the scourge of gender-based violence. We have invited some of those who are doing, who are doing work in this area. And we believe, um, as Men's Forum in, in, in Houghton Provincial Legislature, that the, the battle against gender-based violence must be fought by us as men. Women are victims of this. Uh, while we, we need to continue empowering women and all sorts of things, but it must be men that stand up and say enough is enough. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Colin Hans. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kubela. Um, at this point, I would like everybody to activate their videos because of the people watching, the participants. Do not mute the video unless you are doing something that, uh, you know, forces you to really, to really actually um, close your videos because of we are watched by many people as we're encouraging people to even watch us on the YouTube channel of the Houghton Provincial Legislature. So it's just my humble request. And uh, yesterday as we were on a rehearsal and also I need to do acknowledgement as this, I mean, I'll be failing in my capacity as a facilitator if you do not utilize this magnificent gents wholeheartedly welcoming each and every person who is participating and those who are listening to us from their homes, from the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. So at this point, Kibona Retulani Malachi uh, uh, is now active. That yesterday as we were uh, opening remarks, Bratulani, Ramalachi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Colin. But Eric uh, Dumedi um, Sefe, like Melan, South Africa, and uh, I'll listen from the from the sidelines. Thank you very much. Ramashaba, Kikala Duti Ramashaba on the like, Ramashaba opening remarks. Brashakes? Is Brashakes there? Yes. Um, I can see Brashakes is now, is now on. Brashakes, open remarks on the Men's Forum Gender Based Violence uh, campaign. Um, Brashakes? Do you have a struggle here? Rema Shaba? She's still muted. Hello? She's still muted. Unmute. Can you hear Welcome me? To the forum, Rema Shaba, Huta Loud and Clear. Can you give us your opening remarks? Yeah, thank you. Let me say good evening to all our viewers and our listeners at home. 
And let me say, acknowledge all the dignitaries that are here uh, to come and uh, attend this uh, webinar stroke uh, seminar on our gender-based violence. I think this is a very important thing and it doesn't start now. If we look at the, the researches, we all know that way back in the 2004, there was one lady who was killed uh, out in the Northwest and uh, it took the law such a long time to, to, to find out what has happened. And here it is now, this kind Gosh. of that experiencing, it's giving us problems. Masaba, you can continue. Yeah, what I'm saying is that um, I think uh, we need to see, like every saying and agreeing that we as men, we need to fight for our, our women. And we need to sit down and make sure whatever we are doing, it's going to benefit us. I mean, GBV, it's a very serious thing in terms of our economy in the country as well. Because without our women leading us, nothing will come right. So we are saying here today, what we're going to discuss and what we're going to come and agree, it's going to be put into practice. And we'd like to see everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, we need to. But at the same time, I would like to request, we need an alarm. When this happens, we need someone to blow a whistle. You know, it has been going on for a long time. But another thing that we need to talk about, we know that people are making living out of this. If we look at three quarters of our screens on television, women are killed. and films are made where women are killed brutally as well, not just easily. So those are the things that we need to sit down and look at and deal with and see how can we do that. Thank you. Dr. Hans, your mic is off, we can't hear you. And that the colon you have uh, muted. I think there's a bit of a struggle, but uh, we are back online. Um, I just want to see the chats because I'm trying by, by all means to check if everybody is on board. I see many people are still having initials on, their videos are not activated. Can everybody activate their videos and we can just mute the microphone so that we can see and acknowledge everybody who's on board. And Holy Jalo, Kitobata Rem Papa Kanyani to come in and give us an opening remarks because I can see the video it's on. Activate your 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 microphone, Rem Papa. Activate your microphone on the screen. Yeah, as part of the the the, the, the opening remarks, one would like to express a sincere appreciation that we are all under this roof. We are on this platform expressing our Yeah, I'll use the the phone because I know I'm always getting disturbed with, with the, the oh yeah, oh yeah I'm back, I'm back on the desktop. Yeah, so what, yeah, I'm, so saying what I'm saying is that uh, we are, we are uh, all afflicted here yeah? based, based, based on the sketch. Rekanyan, you can. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening. listening. Yeah, let me use the phone. 
because I know the phone might not really disturb me, and then I'll leave the desktop. So for me, it's just to uh, express my appreciation that we are all here, and then in one uh, motive that uh, we have to deal with the issue of gender-based violence. And uh, I must say, it is my noblest wish that uh, when we get out of here, this would not just be mere discussions, exercise in futility, theoretical. We need to move beyond and make sure that we practicalize this, come up with a clear pro program to make sure that we address the ills of the society. And it is on that note that I must say, one is strict, one is flattered that we are all here. I know we are going to rise in exasperation, but let's deal with the issues. Let me thank you, uh, the facilitator. Aruna. And uh, if we were to go back to our notes yesterday, at this point, I would like to check the availability of uh, the deputy chair, the deputy chair, as in Dr. Moleko. Is uh, Dr. Moleko I'm present? Here. Yes, I am. Your turn now, Dr. Moleko. Welcome to the chair. Thank you so much. Can I uh, go forward? Uh, yes, is that a go ahead? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I just want to observe uh, the protocol and just uh, greet the Honorable uh, Daduka Nyane, uh, the Deputy Chairperson of Committees and uh, Chairperson of the Men's Forum, Honorable uh, Makubela, uh, to the uh, uh, guests who have agreed. Uh, a good evening uh, to all of you. I will uh, also then uh, say good evening to my colleague, Commissioner Rakolote. And all those who are watching, a very good evening to you on this uh, chilly uh, winter evening that you've joined us on, issue that we are dealing with uh, this evening. Colleagues, what I want to uh, outline, I'm standing here as uh, a representative from the Commission for Gender Equality. We uh, have been established as a constitutional body emanating from uh, Section 181 of the Constitution. Now, what I want to highlight is that in our efforts to advance gender equality and promote gender equality using the tools that we have, uh, I'm going to go right into it and say, what are we doing wrong? I think we have seen a lot of uh, remarks on the status quo. We've seen a lot on uh, the current uh, issues that are on the ground, lives that are being lost. And I think I want to point us to some of the systemic issues uh, that may be leading us to this. And I have a very short while to do this. Uh, so I'll get to the first point. One, the large majority of men, several studies have. One of the studies that I would point to speaks to the high level of predisposition of trauma, childhood trauma, stress disorder, and a predisposed experience of trauma in men who actually commit these abuse and these atrocities. We do not necessarily focus enough on some of the root causes. And I believe today in Gauteng, if we could begin to deal with the predisposed trauma that is prevalent in our society, we can begin to start to reduce the incidence of GBV and not only deal with the after effect of GBV. The second thing I want to highlight is the economic inequalities in South Africa. They exacerbate the disempowerment of powerlessness. Now you find this is both on the side of the victim and the side of the perpetrator. Again, I'm referring to some studies that I can that point to this. And I think on both ends, we need to look at programs and interventions uh, that ensure that our women, our children, our families are capacitated economically. Uh, the third point, there was a study done uh, that points to 33% of our uh, victims having experienced uh, violence in where they've grown up, pro probably in the childhood setting. And the predisposition to violence 
likens and shows that there's an increased link and a correlation later on in life to finding you trapped in this type of a situation. So again, the issue of violence in our society, the predisposed societal norms uh, are a problem in society. The failure of our programs to deal with the mitigation, our current programs, the design of our current programs, they don't necessarily quell the systemic failures that we are finding in the system. And I think we need to start to look at evidence-based programs that are actually going to reduce the incidence of GBV at a schooling level before we even reach the higher levels in terms of adulthood. And I think we need to begin to look at how at a very level, because some of these are fundamental in our society and in our structural norms. Then the very important point of the criminal justice system not being designed for victims. We can go at length on the secondary victimization that victims actually in our system. And we've seen various cases that have been televised. The type of question, the manner of question, the way in which a victim is dealt with in the court is as though you yourself are a perpetrator and you yourself are under trial. And I think the design of our criminal justice system is something we need to look at in detail. There's scientific evidence that points to the prevalence of a higher level of incidence when uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse is. So we need to look at the legislative prescripts around the management of alcohol in our society, the use of alcohol. And we're not saying that everyone who drinks becomes a perpetrator of gender-based violence. But what we find is that the incidence and the scientific evidence points to that when there's inebriation or or large amounts of alcohol that are consumed, this heightens the risk of victims, but also the incidence of the violence uh, from the side of the perpetrators. And then the last point I want to point to that uh, we must be very careful on the evidence pointing to that South Africa's penalties, harsher penalties, corrective action is needed. Let us all be on the same page there. What we're finding though, is that it doesn't, Laws such as uh, castration, laws that have been propelled media and social platforms that speak to the death penalty, these do not deal with the core issue of power and dominance that are generally the drivers of sexual violence, sexual assault, and these type of crimes. So we need to look at harsher penalties, but preventative measures. So countries where you have things like uh, death penalty, there is no reduction in the incidence of these violent crimes because you are killing people or because you are taking them uh, to death. So we need to start to look at ways to make sure that the harsher penalties and the corrective action is appropriately targeted at the perpetrators, absolutely, uh, but as well uh, to look at the appropriate mechanisms. So I want to stress the point that rape is not about sex. The act is sexual, but not the motivation. Uh, it's about power, it's about dominance. Attitude that we see in society points to very strong social and cultural norms that need to be critically reviewed, critically assessed. In South Africa right now, if you look at the economic inequality that exacerbates our fundamental uh, problems in our society, issue of schooling, access to schooling, access to uh, equal pay, access uh, these uh, basic things can be significant game changers to some of the outcomes that we would likely see on the ground. So the question then, I want to point to the legislator, to, to the to the Gauteng provincial legislature, is to say, what can you do? How can we as a society present different outcomes? What are the necessary game changers? So I'd put points that I'm going to propose and take forward. And I like the proposal by the uh, by the program director who said, can we not have a talk shop and rather point to what actions we must put in place? I want to propose firstly, there is a national strategic plan that has been adopted by the country. We need to prioritize of the 20, those that are game changers. So you have 24 priorities to say that if those that can change the outcomes and also focus on prevention in Gauteng, that would change a lot 
The second thing you need to do is that you need to ring fence the budget allocation for gender-based violence as a half pain. You cannot be general about this. You have to be focused. And if you are serious, there must be a budgetary allocation to fund these prioritization so that they can be actioned by the relevant uh, departments, institutions, and stakeholders. The second point, you need to view the epidemic. The gender-based violence the statistics that uh, Honorable uh, Makubela started with, they point to the incidence of gender-based violence as an epidemic. Therefore, as we have seen with the COVID epidemic, this is the necessary type of response that is required for an epidemic. You've got to monitor the incidents, you've got to fund actively, and you've got to coordinate the response at a government level. And we've seen how the government has coordinated itself well on the we need the same for the economy, we need the same for GBV. And I want to propose that the Gauteng legislature, a hotspot, will track the hotspot areas where they can begin to collect data and begin to where the care needs to be. The CGE has done a report on the shelters, and there's a framework we have recommended on how you can program and support, for instance, the, vi the victims of uh, GBV with the shelter program. There is a lot that can be done with the data management targeting spot areas. The fourth uh, point I want to recommend is that we need to send policing and resources to our overburdened senior public prosecutors system and as well, should also have a watchdog approach to the criminal justice system. The case is taking too long. We've seen too many people being given uh, a, a bail. We've, we've seen too many situations that are not in the media that actually are not receiving the attention that they need to receive. And that requires resourcing so that you can adequately respond. And I think the most important and the last point as well is the issue of economic empowerment of victims and women in the economy, the employment of women in the formal economy and in the informal economy, and the issue of preferential procurement and investment in women. Uh, the legislature and the Gauteng government need to look at specific economic assistance that is provided to women to reduce the economic dependence on victims, of victims. So if perpetrators economically empowered and they are the ones that victims are relying on, the likelihood of them staying in these type of relationships is heightened. What you want to do is put in place measures to ensure that women do not have to rely on perpetrators and they can leave. And this happens when they're economically dependent. So you've got to reduce the dependence of uh, victims in this case. I've been given eight minutes. I wanted to colleagues, I'm going to stop there. But we as the CGE would partner with you in respect to this. We've done a lot of research and a lot of uh, investigations. We want to make input Gauteng legislative um, bill on alcohol and other input that we can make in so far as strengthening these five key points uh, that I've mentioned. Very important aspect that now is on the cards is the issue of alcohol and the prevalence of alcohol. Alcohol is not the driver of gender-based violence. It is simply a lubricant or an enabler. It works with outcomes. So is begin to look at how the mismanagement or the non-compliance of our uh, chabines or taverns or even establishments in place are not complying to laws. The closeness of these establishments to schools, the closeness, do they close on time? Are they following the le legislative prescripts and the liquor laws in the area? And these are the things that need to be tightened. I will end colleagues. Thank you very Thank much, you very uh, much uh, Dr. Dr. Leko. Leko. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Leko. I also want to ask you, you, I don't know why am I, because uh, there's too many sounds coming out. Dr. Maliko, thank you very much for the contribution. I think for the sake of uh, progress, uh, maybe I should have uh, people using the icon on uh, their system, that is uh, raise your hand so that we can have a speedy process. But also in our midst, I would like to acknowledge, um, in our midst we have uh, participants and uh, also I just received uh, that in our midst we have Ms. Uh, Maba to Rama Hoshi, the Special Advisor to Minister of Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. If you are on the platform, surely you can uh, 
grace us and give us uh, your opening remark. Mama Batu. Hi, good evening to everyone. Uh, Chairperson of the Men's Forum, Ndate Matkubela, Deputy Chairperson of Committees, Ndate Kanyani, ladies and gentlemen and the viewers. Uh, I'm representing the minister who could not be with us this evening uh, with, uh, around the issue of gender-based violence. I think for me, my opening remarks will actually start from the opening remarks of the chairperson where he indicated that men can't be neutral anymore. The, the chair was quoting different uh, speakers around women empowerment. And I think what, what stood up for me was the issue of women being silent, that South African women are not silent. South African women have been going out in numbers every time saying enough is enough. My body is not a crime scene. However, it has been women fighting alone without men taking responsibility of the gender-based violence. So what we are appreciating from what Gauteng legislation has done is that now men are taking responsibility for gender-based violence, are taking responsibility for changing the behavior because women are not abusing themselves. We really appreciate that you are now in the forefront because once you are in the forefront and start challenging toxic masculinity, that makes South African men to be so violent. There are different studies, yes, that indicate how most men are, have been brutalized. But there are other studies that even show that men from the same communities who have gone through the same traumas do not abuse women the same way that others do. So I think as a country, as we start looking at gender-based violence, I want us to go back to what the deputy chair of the, of the CGE was talking about, that we now have a national strategic plan on gender-based violence, a plan that was developed out of a summit that was called by women who were also, who shut down the streets to say, we cannot continue this way. Women in this country are being killed. So we've got a, a, a national strategic plan that has yeah. been consulted nationally. There has been partnership between government and civil society organizations, the private sector, that must be implemented by all. I hear sorry, the, sorry, sorry, madam. Can I interrupt there? To all the participants who are on, please mute your microphones because of there's somebody already on the platform. Please do that as you join us. Thank you. Continue, ma'am. So I, 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 I was saying that we now have a, a, the NSP that has been approved by cabinet. That is a framework that each and every South African must implement for us to eradicate gender-based violence. Now, uh, the NSP has six pillars. And each pillar would want people working in it to ensure that we do not falter and fail women in the country. The first pillar on the NSP speaks about accountability, coordination, and leadership. Gender-based violence in the country, sometimes we, were, we might say it has continued because we have been working in silos. Each and every organization dealing with issues of gender-based violence were not coordinated. But also there was no accountability. I think the deputy chair uh, has also raised the issue of, of leadership and, and accountability in the different system, whether it's the police, whether it's the criminal justice system, but also the service providers themselves. So the, that pillar is saying we all have to come together. We have to be accountable for our action. And, and what I like about what the men sector is doing is that as men, you now are going to hold other men accountable for their action. As men, we now have to, you know, there's a saying that almost every woman knows a man who has raped or killed, but most men don't know men who have raped or killed while they come from their own communities. So we have to be accountable and call out our brothers, call out our friends who are abusing in, in, our, in our midst and take a leadership in all programs that deal with gender-based violence. And we need to coordinate. 
so that from community level, there's coordination from a district level, provincial and national, so that we move away from silo mentality that does not assist us in coming with programs that we need. The second pillar speaks about prevention and rebuilding social cohesion. It is so disheartening to every time hear that South Africa is number one in the world, is the rape capital of the world. So South Africa has high femicide uh, cases in the world. And you ask yourself, what is it that makes so many men so angry to kill women and children? So we need to go back to social cohesion, rebuilding the nation, ensuring that we protect each other. We ensure that there are safe spaces for women in their homes, in communities, workplaces, that every South African will also enjoy the benefits that come with, with democracy. So the issue of rebuilding this nation is critical. There are, yes, wounds that have been open, and those wounds might not have been closed. So the, the, the NSP is also looking at redressing and ensuring that we, we, we rebuild that. And men, uh, the men's sector could also play in this pillar that talks about prevention. It's critical that most of our programs, as you know, they were reactive. We were whether the when the pe person goes to the police, already violence has happened. When a person goes to the shelter, already vi violence has happened. So we need to now look at programs that prevent violence from happening. Parenting programs, men's programs, programs that targets religious section, programs that uh, targets traditional leadership, so that all the uh, cultures and, and, and practices that promote gender-based violence, they stop before they, they happen. And we have now a cohesive nation. Peter number three speaks about justice, safety, and protection. The criminal justice system is critical to ensure uh, uh, survivors of gender-based violence have uh, confidence that they can use it. We want a reactive criminal justice system. We want police who are reactive and people that have, they feel safe when they go to report, but also we want communities that feel safe and protection. Now, as legislators, you need to, you need to ensure that communities are safe spaces for women and children. You need to ensure that there are no places that do not have lights. You need to ensure that where there is tall grasses, they are being cut. You need to ensure that you have uh, police that are visible in the streets because visibility has shown that where there's police visibility, crime also goes down. So Gauteng as, as a legislation, maybe you might be that a big beacon of hope for the country where we can, other provinces can learn from because we, you've got this men went for up. The pillar number four speaks about response, care, support, and healing. Now, response that is react, that is quick, that we, people will know in a community that when they call the, a number that comes from Houting, a response will be immediate, or they know that in three minutes they will they will be responding. For now, you find that even the toll free numbers that we have are not as quick and as, as responsive, and they add to secondary victimization. We they need to ensure that there are enough shelters in the province but the shelters that also have social workers in, shelters that have psychologists, shelters that if they are being opened by civil society organizations, that they are funded to provide service. So the response is critical, the care is critical, the support in the health system, in the justice system, in the police system is critical. And also the issue of healing. Healing is a... a a first, I mean, the, the NSP has included healing that was not there in different interventions. That if we acknowledge that we are dealing with a nation that is broken, therefore we must invest in programs that heals. We need to invest in programs that are going to deal with the head so that we do not have people who re, uh, 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 
sorry, we don't have people, Ben Swan, we don't have people who continue re- victimizing uh, uh, survivors of gender based violence. So I think as a province, you can also lead in, in funding programs that focuses on healing, in funding programs that deals with men, because also there are men who are hurting, however, they do not have uh, opportunities or services that they can go to when they are uh, uh, they need service. Pillar number five speaks about economic power. And I think the deputy chair raised that, uh, that we've got sometimes survivors who stay with perpetrators because they depend on them as uh, providers. So as a province, ensure that you've got gender responsive budgeting planning, but in, in, in the bottom line, put money in the hands of women. Ensure that programs that you have, they empower women. There must be safe spaces for women at work. You must deal with sexual harassment at workplace so that when it happens, survivors of gender-based violence at workplace are able to report. And when they report, they should know that there will be consequences and they will not be held, uh, they will not lose their jobs because more often than not, as the deputy has spoken, it's about power and control. So the one who has power is the one that you will definitely be the one uh, abusing. We need to ensure that the issue of promotions, we the, the, there is research now from, from the uh, Department of Labor that shows that even in government, women doing the same job are not paid the same with men. That men, when they go get into the public service, they are not paid at the entry level. So you still find that even in the public service, there is disparity between the amount of money that goes into women's hands and the one that goes to men's hands. And so that you, there is preferential procurement for women. So I think what, what is critical as, as legislature, monthly get reports of procurement in departments see where the money has been given to in the in terms of procurement how the percentage of procurement given to women it should be what you are asking every time because we know that studies in the country indicate that most families are female headed therefore the burden of responsibility is high on women than on men but the, the money that they receive is not enough and then the last f- pillar speaks about research and information management, that we need to invest in research. We need to invest in research that that will tell us the type of men that is abusive. So that you, the program that the intervention programs that we're having, the intervention programs that we that have been implemented now, we need to take them to scale because they are working at different level, at community level. Now, if the evidence shows that in community one, there was high level of gender-based violence, but since this program was is implemented, they have seen reduction. So then that program must be taken to scale and so that ultimately we eradicate gender-based violence. So as, as the department, I think for, for us, we applaud the initiative that the, 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 the men's forum has taken. We are inviting the men's forum to find areas in, in the NSP, in the different pillars where they can uh, participate. We now have different volunteers per pillar who are bringing their different skills in them. We are going to uh, ensure that the different task teams are cascaded at the provincial level. So the legislature can, can now lead in ensuring that you, you now have these task teams at the provincial level and you have each pillar with the right people that are going to ensure that they bring the skills that maybe we can see gender-based violence being eradicated in our lifetime. Let me stop there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maruna. Maruna, Maruna, Petsa Kubwa Jalo. Memaba Tugama Oshi. 
and uh, please mute your microphone, uh, Mabatu. Now, also, we have to acknowledge uh, the presence of Honorable Leseho, Leseho Makubela. Uh, if uh, Honorable Leseho Makubela is present, maybe as the opening remarks from the men's forum as the chairperson. Honorable Makubela, are you in our midst? Leseho Makubela. I think that the hands you are running the program backwards. I've already given opening remarks. I'm here. I've introduced myself. Thank you very much. Uh, is that Rare <laughs> Tulani? Please, uh, maybe you should get your videos on because of I'm struggling based on that because of on the screens I have three people who are on. So uh, is that Rare Tulani Malachi? Retulani Malachi. Rele Soko Makubela has given us an opening remarks because of because of time was just uh, not on our side. But oh, oh, on the same token, Re, Re Mashaba Kimoni, and maybe let's go back to what we were discussing yesterday because of we we had Re Patrick Shai voicing very critical issues on gender based violence, talking about the policing of protection orders management, the structures within communities, yeah, and yeah, police yeah. maybe visibility. Yes. Rep. Patrick Shai. Maybe uh, also, uh, Rep. Patrick Shai. Yes, I'm here, sir. Maybe just before uh, you, you make your contribution, Rep. Shai. I think let's do this, colleagues. On your icons, there is a raise, raise your hand, because of we know it's a teething program. We still have to organize this and go in smooth on it. Maybe people should raise their hands because of gender-based violence is one of the other problems that we've been facing for many years. I mean, you look at it from a point where the president has also said that, you know what, the second pandemic is the gender-based violence. Maybe by raise of hand, then we can, you know, get into the motion and, speedily go into the situation it's more relevant. Rep. Patrick Shai, the platform is yours. Uh, thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I struggled a bit to connect technology. Yesterday, Nelly Brasheksi, Nadia is one upon me. Yes, I, I wanted us to, to look at how we can manage and police effectively the, the gender-based violence because I feel this is where we fail. After the issuing yeah, the protection order, we leave it to the victim. And my suggestions are, I'll table them as such. The, all the key players, which include your justice, the courts, the family courts, every institution that deals with intimate um, conflicts, the, the subs, the police station, they should be able to share information. And maybe we then need to set up a, a special task team that polices uh, uh, the issuing, yeah, the, yeah, the, court, yeah, the protection order, which will then make sure that once that information is circulated, the relevant police station is then, is then charged with the responsibility of making sure that the person who received the protection order is, is, is visited almost on a daily basis. If not, the person who requested a protection order will receive a protection and frequent visits by the, the, the agents of, of safety as, as in, in Mapodisa or any other institution that would have been. Because the courts, they know where the problems are. They know who are the players who have been issued with protection orders. Maponisa, they know who had reported and who was referred to the to the to the to the courts to get the protection order. Now, with family courts, because they're dealing a lot with intimate conflicts, they have a lot of information which they can then uh, share with the local relevant police station to say be on the lookout. There is a problem in at house number involving Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so. 
So they need to be constantly policed. And I think that way we will be able to prevent as opposed to getting ready to respond to an event but also the other biggest challenge with prevention yeah, gender-based violence and femicide, it's the nature, yeah, yeah, the crime itself. It's so intimate that the only time we get to know that Patrick Shai is a perpetrator, it's after the fact, after the deed is done. So every one of us is a potential perpetrator until, until they've committed a crime. So by that time we are late, we are basically responding to a crime. So the, the, how does community participation come into being? That we make public, we form partnerships with the local newspapers. Every time a protection order is issued against a particular potential uh, perpetrator, it must be circulated in the newspapers so that even the community members know that Patrick Shire has been issued with a protection order. And that way, community can also discharge its responsibility towards making sure that the, the, the victim or would-be victim is protected constantly. What is divorce? When I the problem saying that, what is divorcing? A lot of people, uh, victims, get killed uh, while undergoing the divorce uh, processes. That now, we, we are not proactive enough to share the information. The lawyers, the legal fraternity are not, they are treating it as a private matter. And, and this is where, you know, where a guy would then say, let me set, settle it my way. So we have to get somehow, get a legislation that says all divorce cases or proceedings cannot be privatized. They must go public. For the purpose, the, the, the other partner is protected from the other partner. But communities must also be informed of people that have been issued with protection orders so that we actually break the silence. The silence that is around the protection orders. So that even community can then go to the local police station and say, who have you given the responsibility to? Who is investigating this case? Who is the peace officer discharged to make sure that the person who is affected, who is a potential victim, has protection 24-7? We'd be looking at it like, you know, the, the victim protection um, uh, system, I don't know what they call it, that, that victims who give out information, who are state witnesses in serious cases, are then protected by the state. Yeah, I think it's a victim protection service of some sort. But we need to be able to, to be preemptive so that we are preventing, so that we are not always in a state of readiness, as if we're waiting for a woman to be killed so that it can become an illustrious event where we light candles, where we, uh, it, we, we it, it's, me, I'm just getting sick with how we respond so late. And we can call for heavy judgment, harsh sentences. It is late by the time we even request the Department of Justice to, to issue serious long sentences. It is late. Every campaign, everything that we do must seek to prevent the killing of a woman. And if we do so, I'm telling you guys, we will be able able to ensure that we reduce the need for the places of safety for, for women and children. There will be in, in the next five years or so. If we are a proactive citizen, we develop proactive citizens and all organs of the state, we declare women and children properties of the state. And then we guard them with all the resources that the state has. I shall submit uh, to the chair. Um, thank you very much, Ray Patrick Shai. There's a question coming from the social media directed to Honorable Sehoma Kubela, and it reads thus: the establishment of uh, establishment of structures at what level will be much important with churches and other key community organizations being part of this initiative. 
There should be clear annual program targeting both women, men and children, boys and girls, to raise awareness and education toward the service. Now, uh, Rama Kubela, this one is uh, is directed to you. Really, so what to say? Uh, there's no, there's not much happening at what level. Are we not taking this matters very serious of gender-based violence? Are we just doing talk shows and uh, we are not practical in in realizing this uh, these activities? Thank you very much. Uh, I think I think what we should do is that all of us will then look at those chats, respond to some of them, all of us collectively. And I think that the comment on Facebook is very is very important. Important in the sense that you need uh, where the tire meets with the tar uh, at, at 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 what level, where the people are. You need to be able to mobilize all sectors of society to be vigilant, to be able to play a role that is uh, that is able to assist us in fighting the sketch of gender-based violence. I think. Dr. Ntavise Moleko would have uh, spoken about the the inequalities, the economic inequalities that, that also fuel this, uh, the role of shebins, the role of taverns, the role of of alcohol as, as conduits, as, as some of the things that propel some of the behavior that is happening. And these are some of the things that we need. If you can look at the panelists for today, that's why <coughs> ourselves as a uh, as politicians, we don't want to speak because we have called the people that we feel that you know they are respect they are representing the broad spectrum of society and will be able to assist us in coming with solutions to that we can take <coughs> to the grassroots level. If you speak about that Sheikh Mashaba who's sitting here with us, he has a vast experience of 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 of, of being a coach, coaching boys, coaching men. <clears throat> he has dealt with their psyche and he knows where the challenges are. And that's why we've invested them so that we can also take this and go back to, to the grassroots level, mobilize churches, mobilize all NGOs, soccer coaches, and all sorts of things. Because what we undermine with with this, uh, the, with the people who are, especially whether, whether they are soccer coaches who are working with men, they are not just soccer coaches. They are also uh, mentors. They are also um, guiding these young men. They see them as fathers. They see them as role models. And these are some of the things that we need to start working on, that we need to start focusing on, that we need to get government to and the private sector to support them uh, in, in all these things. So I, we don't want to speak much as politicians. We want this platform to be shared by the panelists that are here who will then be able to give us all this input. We are taking the, we are noting the input on Facebook. <coughs> Sorry, it's not Corona. Uh, we are noting the input on, on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we will, will be, will be compiling them. And in a matter of days, we will be announcing all these com comments, all these contributions, all the inputs that are made. We'll be taking them to the legislature to then say, let's now pass the laws that, that, that are different from the current laws that are existing, which are not assisting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, let me check the hands raised. Kibone Letsohola, Laha Sediko, Rakolote. Thank you, Chairperson. On the issue of the establishing structures at the world level, currently at local government, we've got world committees that are chaired by, by the councillors. I think it's high time that the, the legislation that governs award committees also includes the issue of the award committees having a structure or a program that deals with gender-based violence. The councillors themselves must be capacitated on issues of gender equality and be the phases of driving the fight against gender-based violence at the award level. We've got the structures already in terms of the award committees. It's just to capacitate those structures that are on the ground. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Ruela Ko Me Mabatu Ramasho Hosi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to agree with the suggestion of community level structures. And these are also proposed in the National Strategic Plan. Communities that we need to include, the, the street committees, we need to include community policing forum. Because as, as uh, 
Patrick was saying, unfortunately, most of interventions happen after the event. Now, each and every community know who in that community is causing problems. And more often than not, they will even call elders around the community to come and engage. But there is nothing that becomes a deterrent for the person to continue. So when, when the, uh, the president was talking about the second pandemic, and he also spoke about the bystander uh, uh, mentality, that we know what's happening, but we also say, as long as it's not happened to me, we don't do anything. But if each and every one of us can start taking action that it is not going to happen in front of me. So the perpetrators will not have a space where they can continue abusing. So I agree with, with street community, committees. I agree with community level. I also say, because the, the, the NSP says at community level, the structure must be chaired by mayor of a delegated person. At a provincial level, the structure must be chaired by a premier or a delegated person. So it becomes everybody's business to deal with gender-based violence. The, the religious fraternity now, they've come on board. We have a partnership with them. They have come on, on board with uh, UN Women where they have been going through training on how they deal with gender-based violence utilizing the, pul the pulpit. And we could have seen since Father's Day they have been having messages on gender-based violence. There are now this, there are sermons that are starting to preach against gender-based violence. And we want each and every sector, if they can do that, do whatever space at the Shebin level, UN Women is working with taverns now and, and utilizing that space of talking about issues on gender-based violence. So there should not be a space where gender-based violence is not addressed. There should not be a space where it's cool to have a, an older man uh, having a relationship with a young child. So men must start engaging around those uh, spaces. There should not be a, a, a space where if a woman reports, the, the men, whether it's in the legislature, do not make a statement. Because we, the more you make a statement, the more they see that, oh, there's no longer a, 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 a free space for them to, to abuse. So I, I support community level structures, but also holding a, a gender a, a perpetrators abuse. The Department of Justice now, they have, they are busy with amending the bills. The Domestic Violence Act is being uh, amended. The Sexual Offenses Act has been amended. So they're looking at stricter uh, bail conditions because we can't say people should not get bail. It's unconstitutional. So until you amend the act that provides for that, they, they're still continue, going to go, continue. They are also looking at issues of uh, the protection order in the domestic violence act that if, the people can even do it electronically because there have been issues around the, the order also. So there, has, there are work being done around uh, legislation, but I agree with, with, with Patrick, all those are coming after the act. It's, it's reaction, not prevention. Now, I also acknowledge Shanika. Uh, she's been there for long, uh, followed by Rek Hanile and uh, Dr. Muleko, respectively. Shanika? Good evening, everyone. You know, um, Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. You know, um, I just want to greet everybody that's here, the honorables, the chairperson, the panelists, the viewers and listeners at home. You know, GBV is a profound and widespread. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Um, you know, um, GBV is and widespread problem impacting on almost every aspect of life. So there is a huge rise in cases of violence directed at women, children, rape, and, and femicide, especially during the COVID-19 lockdown. So I did some research, and research statistics state that um, the number of GPV cases has risen 
50% since the start of the COVID-19 lockdown. I mean, that's quite a lot. I really find it apparent that women continue to be killed and abused, mostly by people close to them. So the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated the problems faced by women in abusive relationships because they become trapped with their abuse, abuse with no possibility to escape or call for help. So the country was recently mourning um, uh, eight months of, uh, eight months pregnant, uh, who's, who's 21 years old, who was buried after I was recently found hanging from a tree um, with multiple wounds to her chest. And she is not the only one. There are many other cases that have been reported and have not reported yet. I've quite a few inboxes on my social media platforms. Um, the day, the first day when I posted um, the, 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 the ads for this, uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. And there's a, a 15 year old that uh, disclosed to me on my inbox. She said, um, you know, I'm so glad that you guys are able to speak, um, to, to speak about this because I stay with my dad because I stay with my dad and my dad is the um, is with me. And the only thing is it's difficult to talk because he's the breadwinner at home. And he's, he's, the, he's the one that pays my school fees. And now the child is, is, is afraid to open up and speak about such issues because she's afraid. So um, I'm speaking here as a, as a, as a survivor, um, as a GPV survivor. Mm -hmm. my was taken at, at age six, if you can imagine. Um, you know, um, one thing that I can say is that um, I know and I understand how those people feel and I understand the, the, the situation that they are at. And one thing that I've discovered is that history has its own way of repeating itself. Because the minute you keep quiet about it, that's the more... Um, this the, 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 the incident continue um, happening because um, if you, you, you attract people or people get attracted to you for the same thing, when they look at you, they just see somebody that they can actually, you know, sleep with, somebody that they can actually abuse, somebody that they can actually, do you understand? So um, I feel like, um, G and this thing is a very serious matter because um, when I was, 15, because it actually started when I was six. And at 15, imagine the age gap in between, because you thought, no, you know what, I got away worth it. And at age 15, got to experience this thing again. But now it was not one person. It was it was a gang, a gang rape, gang, you, know, gang rape. You, know, you know. So having to go through such um, and having to keep quiet and not speak about such things. It's really a, a problem because it leads to psychological trauma, um, behavioral and physical consequences for survivors. And in many parts of the country, um, I feel like there's so many ways. Um, I know and I understand that the government has done so much um, to um, help and to find uh, solutions to such kind of problems. But um, in many parts of the country, I think I did mention this yesterday, in many parts of the country, there is poor access to um, formal psychosocial or medical support, meaning that survivors are unable to help to get the help that they need. So we need to make sure that as we, after we are done with this, people know where to get help. Even those that are in rural areas, even those that are not, um, 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 I, 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 uh, don't have access to internet, but they they have ways to make sure that. that um, if I'm going through this, then this is what I, I need to do, you know. Um, but I feel like the only solution here is um, is to deal with the root of the problem. We might be actually looking at the outside of the problem. Uh, men are doing this. Uh, this is what is happening to women. But we forget one thing: the root of the problem. So um, we have to we have to uproot and tackle the sexual harassment and rape culture in our homes. Because this doesn't only happen in our homes, it also happens in the schools, colleges, workplaces, and in churches without favor and bias. 
you know, it is significant to send a very strong message that girls and women are not sex play things and their bodies are not the crime scene. They have the same right with boys and men and they deserve to be treated fairly, not be slaughtered like animals. The devastating effect violence has on women is worth noting. And we have been mainly focused on the effects instead of preventing it from occurring. So it is not important for us to actually focus on the effects. We need to make sure that we focus on the occurrence of this um, situation. We need to understand that women cannot solve this pandemic on their own. Excuse me, sorry about that. Women, um, women cannot uh, 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 um, solve this pandemic on their own. Men must stand up and prioritize our focus on prevention of gender-based violence. Development of educational programs is needed urgently. That is what we need right now. Development of educational programs is needed urgently, which will enable men and boys in dealing with behavior and attitude change, tackling, uh, I think also when we, when we can also focus on tackling uh, masculinity, will require both men and women, you know, to work together, to raise boys and groom them while they are young. You know, failure, failure to do so will lead us to vulnerable, emotional, broken, shattered or fragmented generation that would threaten the future of this country. So that's not what we need right now in this country. Um, we are still the future of the generation and we want our country to grow. We want um, a, a, a better future for our world. We want a better future for our country. But you know what? I'm 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 very honored, and I, I, I'd like to acknowledge the GPL um, Men's Forum. Um, you guys have stood up. You know, um, I'd like to thank all of you, um, the Men's Forum, for taking up the space. Men's voice is much needed. Needed because women alone could never conquer this pandemic without joining hands with men. So tackling societal challenges requires both of genders to work interdependence. So let us get up and start working together. Um, I was given eight minutes, sorry. Um, so I think I need to stop, but um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that will be Honorable Kanyile, followed by Dr. Maliko, and also followed by Dr. Mashaba. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, let me take this opportunity also to thank uh, that we have been provided this platform. It's a picture I wasn't part of the discussions yesterday, so I hear everybody's referring to discussions that took place yesterday. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm, um, let me use this platform like Ntatema Kubela has requested that we as members of the legislature must really use the platform to listen. Uh, but just to indicate that it will be interesting for me to understand some of the issues that uh, we should be able to be confronting. The problem I always have is that uh, whenever I get into this discussion, the main focus or the main area of discussion will be the weaknesses will be the weaknesses of the legislation. And I, I'm not sure that's because uh, uh, it's, it's, I'll be present and therefore we'll know that I'm a legislator, therefore issues more focused on legislation. But I must say that uh, one of the things that I think that we could be advised on, and I, I, would, I would love to hear the discussion around uh, whether there, there's, is, is the view out there that Outside of just saying that our legislation has weaknesses and in the way that it is addressed, it sounds like it's questions of people are focusing more on what Nadesha was referring to as uh, what happens after if the law deals with issues after effect. And somebody has been raped, then we come in the arrest. When somebody has been beaten, then we come in the arrest. So is there, I just want to ask a question, is, what is the assessment of legislation as it relates to prevention. Uh, is, are, we, are we of the view that there's a lot that has been done in that regard, not only on le legislation, but are we, are, we, are we of the view that what is the assessment about capacity of government to provide resources to ensure that there's preventative measures 
and systems and this. And I would love if the panelists can be able to assist us with that, because I think it's something that is very important for us. But also just to indicate that uh, the men's forum is not only uh, politicians as in members of the provincial legislature, but it also includes the staff of the legislature, men who are staff members of the legislature. So in that regard, I think that uh, one of the things that we could be advised on is that as the legislature, both members of the legislature or MPLs and also the staff, in the, in the understanding of committee out there, what the legislature is all about, shouldn't we be playing a role of going out into committees and be, and be of influence? Because I think we've got a lot of capable, or, or capable uh, members and also capable staff members who can be able to be only of influence in society because of, the of, 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 of a number of uh, areas of in the society that I can play. The fact and the last thing that I want to raise is that uh, I think that uh, uh, one, one of the advantages we will have as the legislature in particular is that uh, we've got uh, various areas where we are able to touch base. For instance, uh, uh, if we're to focus mainly on preventative measures, it means there are some things that you must do to, uh, to assist even young people as they grow. And this is Zulu Tiwali, which also as an example. So isn't it that uh, through our Department of Education, or our committee in education, isn't there some things that we can do in education? Mm -hmm. Isn't it through our sports, recreation, arts and culture committee that things that we can do in the sports field, in the, in the sports fraternity, in the cultural fraternity, and those, those are things that I thought that will be able to be guided on because those are, those are practical things that you can be able to, to, to do as the legislature. And I'm glad that the last speaker started to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Kanyile, Dr. Moleko, followed by Reshex Mashaba and Bra Patrick Shai. Thank you so much, uh, Program. Um, I want to thank the Honorable Kanyile because he's hitting me where I was about to enter. So I think our order is perfect, uh, Program Director. I, I think his question on, is there not sufficient legislation to look at prevention? So my point was going to primarily focus on this, uh, colleagues. Um, what we uh, would recommend, and I want to point to three areas where the legislature of one, uh, alcohol. There are several provincial alcohol bills. Uh, there are several amendments that can be done uh, that look at various aspects of alcohol and alcohol abuse, uh, substance abuse. The proximity of alcohol uh, increases uh, sexual violence, instances of sexual violence to victims and even perpetrators, perpetrators themselves, the incidence is heightened because of the abuse of alcohol. Uh, we know that primarily this is a psychological issue, uh, it's a hot issue, uh, but alcohol, the prevalence of alcohol, the misuse of alcohol is something that can be focused on in respect to this. The second one is the issue of teaching consent. There quite clearly is a problem, and it was found in Kenya that uh, the understanding of what consent was, a basic issue of consent, we can have a debate now. If we were to ask our uh, young people, teenagers um, who are in schools and you would have a talk show and find out what do they understand as consent? Uh, what do they think consent is sexually? Uh, and even older men, uh, in, what do they think sexual consent is? When you look at the... Um, statistics of uh, rape in the country. The incidence of rape in South Africa is the highest in the world globally. We're always leading on the wrong thing. If it's not inequality, not being right with A and A number, number last, but then even on the issue of rape, we are first. This is a, uh, why is the issue of consent not understood? Uh, is it when the, the girl is playing hard to get? Is it you push her until you get what you want? understand as consent because that's what you've been socialized to understand consent as and i think prevalent prevalence of this misunderstanding of what is consent when a woman says no what does no mean no is no is a no, but there seem to be nuances as to how this is understood, and there's a level of misunderstanding that goes beyond uh, something that we can fathom, and it results in this high incidence of uh, of rape. Men do not understand how to deal with the no. I think the third point is the sexualization of women. I think the over-sexualization of women, even girl children, the laws that can prevent the over 
and then gold children should be looked at in the legislative space and it would reduce this. I think one thing that I want to, want to make a contribution to um, in this discussion is the issue of healing. I know that we specifically like to focus on government agencies. We specifically focus uh, that should try to bring in healing. We've really lost out on significant aspects of the family and uh, faith-based organizations that can actually aid us in this regard. And I want to point that family need to be rebuilt. Things that we have seen related to the breakdown in society that we are seeing now is the breakdown of the uh, men that, that are perpetrators come, every one of them come from a family. Anyone where were they? They didn't grow up in a hole somewhere. They didn't grow up in a dungeon. Uh, they, they, this behavior must have been seen by someone, Udaba or an aunt, or a khadi, a grandmother, or umakulu. Who saw this behavior? Who has uh, maybe pointed and seen it, but has somehow not been able to capture it? Or there is an uncle, there is a, a, a khrut man in the family, who, or there was someone who was feared in the family who behaves in a certain way, allowed to continue this behavior. Uh, accountability in families needs to be brought back. In all of our families, in all of our families, there's probably someone who was mistreated, who has co committed a sexual offense, but they're not held accountable. Our families need healing. Our families are where this problem has started. And the government can never replace families. I want to repeat this. The government cannot replace family. Ward committee, uh, Commissioner Rakoloti, I respect the input on the ward committee, but I think looking at how can we rebuild the family. The, the legislature can bring transformation. The legislature can correct. The legislature, though, needs the family structure to be strengthened. And I think that the kind of degeneration that is prevalent with this blesser phenomenon, how can an old man be allowed to be a, a abusing, coercing a, a, a in high school because they are able to give them favors, uh, financial favors that these uh, young, um, in uh, probably lacking the emotional uh, even depth to understand this unequal power relation. Uh, and I'm, I'm finding that we need to really look at uh, finding ways to, 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 to give help to this broken society. And I think we need to focus on rebuilding the family. I think the second aspect and the last one, I think, um, how do we give men help? And I, I don't think there's enough focus on this. For instance, there are perpetrators who have changed. There are men who used to beat their wives who have seen that this is not the right behavior. How do we strengthen and find ways to help these men uh, in a way that uh, doesn't uh, bring shame after the fact, but rather bring victory before the action? Uh, we need to empower men to actually, if we are, can find mentors, and I think this type of a forum where there can be mentors, there can be places where men can be taught how to communicate, how to deal with their past, how to deal with their past traumas, uh, their stress, fundamental issues that lead to this. Uh, Ms. Commonwealth put, put it quite well. We, uh, Mabato put it very well that we are very reactive. I think Mr. Shai put it, we all... And I think that the men's forum get help. Where can they go? I know victims need the help. I know victims we must put emphasis on. But I think we have a lot of men in our society based on the statistics that need help. And we need to have very clear pathways of providing help to them and also outside of families. And I think, uh, uh, Honorable Kanyele, that will assist us. And we as the CGE will partner where, uh, wherein the GPL needs uh, this type of partnership where we can plan on this and, and use our mandates collectively. All this um, yeah, sufficiently, we would definitely work with. Um, there we go. Um, having a communication with uh, Kukupanung Re, Re Mashaba, please come in. Re Mashaba. Ra Sheikhs, followed by Re Petshai, Petshai, Patrick Shai, then uh, followed by, uh, let's see, Nini Moyo. Thank you, PD. I think uh, much has been said, which needs to be put into practice. 
Elia on me ramachoshi uwile ka working in silos. We have these organizations in place, but the problem is omulo mungwe is asahai. Everyone does the way they want to. I mean, if we look at what is actually happening now, we're not getting much help from the police. If you talk to women today and ask them, why don't you report? They'll tell you, what's the use of going to the police station? Because I'll be told that go and fight and get your things right. How do our women do that alone? Again, another thing that has come out here, we need to address this at early stages. We have formed a, an organization, a partnership with the Houghton Legislature. We are having a program that we call Changing the Lifestyle Through Sports Campaign. Why are we doing that? It's because you find that the boy child is not always reprimanded. When he goes out, he takes his jacket, he's gone. Nobody says, do this, don't do this. But when a girl child goes out of the house, They'll always be told, listen, you got to be careful. You don't do this and you don't do that. What does it say to the boy child? Say, no, I'm a big man. I'm not told much what to do and not to do. So I think what we need to do is point in time. These campaigns that we coming up with, we need to be vigilant. We need to be more uh, uh, applying and visible ourselves. So that when we go into this, as Tate Shahi has said, it won't work out dealing with the after effects of all these things. But at the same time, I want to go back to one of the projects that was introduced, blowing the whistle. There is not enough of blowing the whistle at this point in time. You find that uh, you approach people who are trying to fight and then you ask what's happening. Someone says, no, there's nothing happening. It's just a quarrel. And then you decide to leave and you, you, you go away. I think that is not enough. What we need to do, let us make noise. I mean, you, you, you look at one of the incidents that has happened in past few past weeks. Somebody sends an Uber to go pick up the girl and the Uber comes and pick up. The girl doesn't ask, why not today? Why not the original car comes and pick me up? Why the Uber? Why? What is it that has been hidden? And the biggest thing that we need to be aware of because of this GBV, people are trying to run away from responsibilities. They trying to silence other people. So I think what we need to do now going forward. All our girls, our women, our children, they need to be vocal. Let us not wait until something happens. And the biggest thing is the question of money, economy. Because there is a saying that says, if you're going to really ignore GBV, there's going to be problem with our economics. Our girls, our women, they, they always calm down because they want money. They don't have theirs. They don't have enough. So we need to address those kind of things so that when our children go to school and do all this, they must be able to know that this is what is happening. The program that we're coming up with is a program that we call Changing of Attitudes. We need to deal with this while our kids are still growing up. Yes, I would accept that uh, uh, one is a coach, one is that, but together we can change this. But as an individual, we want changes. I would like to say thanks to all the ideas that came out this evening. But what I would like to ask is, let's put them into practice. Thank you. Prashaks, thank you very much. Also in our midst, I need to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Refisani, Fisani, Fisani uh, Rebone Jalo Mukhaiz, Rebone Jalo Refisani, 
ki Fisani Masinga. We acknowledge your presence. And just after Nini Moyo, we'll then welcome Fisani, Fisani Masinga. Mimi, you can continue. Mini, that's Nini Moyo. Thank you so Nini much, uh, Colin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I noticed that, um, oh, good evening, everyone um, uh, who, who is part of this uh, session. I noticed that uh, we are raising issues of concern and um, in everything that we're talking about, we obviously have to have solutions. And I would like to ask um, Coach um, Ephraim Sheikhs Mashaba, um, as a person of uh, his status with his involvement in football, you know, with um, the um, with with the power, with the tools that he's got, you know, to change the kids' mindsets, is he willing to be part of a red card campaign where we are giving a red card to all sorts of uh, gender-based violence, discrimination against women and children, and where we are educating kids in terms of how they can uh, become, you know, the bright future of South Africa? cutting down on all the social ills that we are facing. Thank you. Brashegs, you can respond. I'm going to uh, have a full bench where I welcome also Miss Commonwealth South Africa. Can you acknowledge that you are in our presence, Miss uh, Commonwealth South Africa? Hello, I'm in. I'm in. Your contribution, please, as part of the panelists. Miss Commonwealth. Okay, we will get the, the contribution because of uh, somebody's uh, sending me messages to say the panelists. And as I requested, everybody who needs to take part should actually use the I, I don't have a hand. I don't have a hand, but you can give me a space at some point. Uh, who are we speaking to, please? Uh, you are speaking to um, Papa Kanyani. Uh, please uh, continue, sir. No, thank you very much. Actually, I was just uh, uh, not necessarily provoked, but I think uh, uh, meant to be saying the issue of the consent. I think it's an issue that is really abstract and is a challenge that we have really to deal with as a society. And I would really say it's something that you can't really deal with it overnight. It needs a very paradigm shift so that there is a clear understanding of a consent. I know I might be coming from different school of thought, but now there is a notion, it might be misguided, that when one says no, because I know that uh, it's, it's a matter of no. But there is this notion that uh, sometimes there should be a bit of a, of a persuasion to move to the yes part of it. And that part is very abstract because at the end, it is more subjective than objective. To an extent that it can be harassment based on certain conditions and it can be accept it can be accept acceptable based on certain conditions so I, i'm just saying it's a part that in most cases lead people into a problem of abuse so now and when you say abuse then it becomes very abstract so I, I'm, I'm just saying maybe we need really to unpack it a bit so that we are able to capture the school of thought from all the sides with that kind of an understanding. But the other part, the element that I want to bring in, it is the issue of the patriarchal domination, which uh, it has been there from time immemorial. And in most cases, it is really embedded in traditional leadership structures and also in the household uh, production units, and also household division uh, of, of labor. So it, it is something that has been there, but I would really affiliate to the issue of maybe we should really have 
a sort of um, training induction because it needs a paradigm of a shift of some sort. I, I, I think those are some of the abstract elements that I think should be in play when we deal with this issue of gender base, but looking at it both ways. Uh, I, I would really submit at that level. Thank you very much. At this point, may I also have a contribution from Mr. Fisani Masinga, if he's in our midst. Masinga. Hello. You are welcome, sir. Your contribution. Okay. I think ooh, there are things that we need to understand as I'm a daughter. Firstly, we need to know that we are the protectors of women. If we don't protect women, we are not protecting ourselves as men. Firstly, in order, into enayo, if unga was a protector, umuntu esfazan, you must know what Tina is about to ask now a future is. To get my point, that is number one. Because abantu esfazan are the bodies are our bodies because we are the head. So if sing ama sing heads, so kunem zimba bodies, ne? So bona bang ama bodies with. If we beat them, if we kill them, we are killing ourselves. That's what you must understand. If we kill ourselves, so where is the country? That is number one. So where are we going if we're killing ourselves? That is the thing you finally see, understand as I'm a dog. And, and number two, we need to check Uguti. You know, Abafana Langapanje, they are very angry because of their fathers who are not there. Because anytime Abafa Abu Baba finally be present. Let me ask Wonkumuntu where we are right now. Uguti, in daughter, Ube corner, Begu Konu Mama, Ogate Ebambe, Ogate E Conceive, Ubaba Wetu, Ubaba Unelson Mandela. If low Mama low, why shy? Wabula. No. This 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 mother when the show uti lumfana uya kula azabengag. Right now, kukona abo mama babula wayo everywhere. But Bebezo spatela ma solution a generation access. But lawo mama bebule la wan pesfazan. Where are we going? Because there is no there is nothing as a wense. And we must understand one thing which in daughter, melenze show, which ea protect. Na y in the final si pegwa. Into eba legile final si pege iti. La paya ekaya. Iba ne father, iba ubaba. Because my There is nothing as oyenza because agana yo irut. Agaza azo tupuma api. Yonke mpili, yonke tazo oyenza, uzo venza jite out of order. So what I'm trying to say, Uguti, Ageko umuntu wesliza noma o indota. Okufanele anga protect umuntu wesfazane. U protect ag umuntu wesfazane. Wenza um protect ag uguti. Avigelege wherever lae kona na lae ya kona. Number two, i protect si na gona njuguti agasha. Kona bantu abashugunye zwa emotional. Emotional. Abanyabana, ya wolma unga suye ipetle la 
uthola aba abantu besifazana abana ma depression because of us as a mother you know umuntu umuntu akashawanga wabana ma scars abantu besifazana abana ma scars most of them but ba feele ngaphakathi you know why because si as lead we are not leaders so what i'm trying to say please asihlanganeni singamadoda sibambane ngezandla sibambane ngezandla sonke sipolise kubantu besifazane sipolise kubantu besifazane because asibabula la ngabaye baya baye mangcwabeni phela but sibabulele nasemimoyeni spiritual emotional physical bafile abantu besifazane so into esidingayo thina let us make sure ukuthi senza show ukuthi abantu besifazane sibathatha sibabheke eduze with and siba project angasaba umuntu wesifazane but maka sihlonipha but these days abantu besifazane basaba instead of basihlonipha you know why it is because of the way asiba treat anga khona please my dot asibamba nengezandla and treat abantu besifazane ngendlela ezoba right because at the end of the day uma singakwenza anga lokho ayizuba khona i generation ezayo and make sure ukuthi ngifana nokuthi eh abantu ubuzwe bethu bonke nabo buyadinga ukuthi bukhunjuzwe bukhunjuzwe ukuthi ubuzwe bonke sikwazi ubuya siye lapha emuva entweni zethu sibuyele emuva entweni siyeke ezinye izinto zezinye izizwe ezingekho la ezingafundiswa ngalokho ethi because uma singakwenzi lokho sizofunda ezinye izinto esingazazi kuma uma cultures because umfana nje uma ingayazi culture yakhe angeke azayenzi the right so abo baba bafundisa ama culture ama culture ebantwana imbabo uma senze njalo yonke into the right thank you very much uh, mr fisani masinga i I've looked at the panelists because the way we started it was sketchy there and there but I'm glad that we've covered all the finalists now maybe I should make a humble request to all the panelists now to have uh, you know to to narrow time to a point that we can fit all the panelists I I need now to to go back to uh, Rep Patrick Shai followed by Rep Memabatu Ramakoshi then we'll have the 3 minutes to just uh, finish off the the program of today Um, thank you chair and and esteemed colleagues colleague, uh, colleagues um I, i just want to bring a small and an observation that i've made and then in so doing i want to acknowledge the amount of work that has been done by the collective uh society as south africa in the fight against gender based violence uh, although i feel we have missed some missed something i am of the view that every perpetrator comes from a home every perpetrator of gender based violence rape or sexual offenses or femicide that boy or that man he is a son of somebody he is a brother of somebody and <clears throat> we we have wonderful campaigns which, which takes place in the public uh, uh, areas but we do not have these conversations these campaigns taking place right in our homes we 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 would be championing so many campaigns out there i'm known to be this and that uh, 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 doing advocacy work but in my home there is no conversations around issues of social justice gender justice and so on and so forth so we have mukuluman daughter a program that we have called uh, unfortunately covid uh, impacted on that program it's the home based gender based violence uh, conversations where it is it has taken the form ya ya makhotla the stockfell society we 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 hosting each other and when we come to your house we have a discussion about issues around gender equality issues around um, uh, 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 walking away issues around communication the skills to listen to hear what the other person is saying So those programs are quite important that perhaps we could adopt them on a broader scale and I like what Brachix is doing but we also need to start focusing more gladly 
The other problem that I have seen is it's because we are not we, we are not sensitized enough around the pain, uh, yeah, yeah, gender-based violence and femicide, to be quite uh, precise, it is that families of the perpetrator, they are so bold to go to court to go and support their, their, their son who has killed another human being. And in some cases, it is a woman who had served or serviced them with love in that family, in their home. Now, what kind of people or society or families are we? When, our, when my son has committed an act of femicide, killed a woman, whether it's brutal or not, but I'm the first one to get a lawyer for my son. I'm the first one to get Inyanga and for my son. Am I waiting for, the, for, the, for gender-based violence, the culmination of which is femicide, to come back into my house so I can begin to understand it. I think families have to be also, you know, we, are, we have to move as family study perpetrator with the family study victim. We should not be seen in court supporting our, our, our children. Yes, you are, you are innocent until proven guilty, but the fact we know as families, we know that you did this deed. So why do we go and support them? I think we need to also start sensitizing families around those issues that discard and disown your son if they ever kill a woman. The last thing, Chair, maybe we also need to take our advocacy, uh, especially in issues such gender based, uh, such femicide, that we don't match to the union building, but we match to the home of the perpetrator so that the perpetrator's family can feel you know, the pain that society is feeling. It is not about us focusing and lighting candles at the victim's house. It is for us to go and hold that vigil. Go into ya the perpetrator, so that other families can say, hey, we don't want this pressure around us. I submit to the chair. Memaba to Ramahoshi. Thank, thank you, chair. Uh, there was an ask from the, the legislator to say, what other proposals can you propose for us? But before I go there, I, I just need to say, consent is never abstract. It has never been abstract. And, and if, if we start from there, that no means no. And Tavisa made it very clear, no means no. So the abstraction of consent, I don't, I don't understand. But as we say, maybe with, with other engagement, we'll talk about that. The uh, that uh, Masinga spoke about men raising their own children, and I think this is the biggest challenge that we're having. And Tabisa also spoke about it. If research says sixty percent of children in South Africa have absent fathers, where are these absent fathers? What are they doing, these absent fathers? How do you hold these absent fathers accountable as men? Because somebody can't be saying, I've got five children, 10 children, and not even one of the kids know the scent of that person. So these kids are raising themselves. And, and I think for, for the legislator, I, if you can start there and see the men in the legislature if they are taking care of their children. Mm. One, one of oh, the things that should oh, be nah. a priority, a, a prerequisite is, are you taking care of your children? Remember, they get paid by the state and their children are taken care by the state from their tax money because uh, they, 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 their wives go and get maintenance. So if you can just start there, how many of them are taking care of their children? Are they paying maintenance? If they're not paying maintenance, how do you assist for, for, for the children to get money from, from their fathers? That's number one. The second thing that I think we, we, as legislators you need to do, because you approve budgets, budget of departments come to you. Do not approve a budget that is not gender mainstream. If they don't talk about the money does not come, come clearly where it's going to women, youth and persons with disabilities, don't approve it. Because then you're talking to 
officials. You are forcing them to mainstream their budgets. Procurement could come from them. And lastly, I think I agree around issues of campaigns that targets behavior change. As part of implementing the NSP, in partnership with, with UN Women, we have brought a, an expert with regards to campaigns from the industry. And one thing that came out in one of the workshops was that our campaigns talk broadly. That's why they don't have an impact. That to have a behavior change, behavior takes years. They, they are formed in, in, for a long time. And even to address that, you need to invest in research so that our campaigns talk to the perpetrator. So we, we need to come together and as one to come with a campaign that will now have an impact and not mm. the ones that we usually have. I mean, the, the person says, you know, I can, you can go to a desert and still sell sand and people will buy because we do research. And so our campaigns don't talk to perpetrators. I think for me, if you look at that, that will be critical. And lastly, can all men's programs come together? We're now seeing everyday men's programs uh, mushrooming, and which we, we appreciate. But because we are, we, we're trying to move away from working in silos, if men can now bring all this group together and as a, as a massive group start talking to men, we'll have definitely an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ma Ramahoshi. At this point, may I bring Honorable Lesoho Makubela for a bit of a guidance because we are, we are having five minutes of the last of the scheduled time. If we can continue to get the closing remarks of every panelist. Re, Re Makubela, your guidance. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think we, we have noted a number of, uh, of things that would have been said by all the panelists. And what is standing out is, 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 is the economy um, um, uh, as, a, as, as a weapon that, we, that must be used to actually fight against gender-based violence. Because most of these women who find themselves in some of these uh, uh, compromising positions that they find themselves in is, is, pro, is predominantly because of the, the levels of, of inequality that exists between men and, and women in terms of uh, um, economic relations. And, and we need to begin to address that. Preferable procurement was, was, was mentioned here. While we speak about pre prefer uh, pre uh, preferable procurement, preferential, uh, sorry about that, preferential procurement, which is aimed at ensuring that we empower uh, women. We must also guard against men who then make women profile pictures of their companies so that they comply to this, so that they look good, so that they satisfy the, the requirements. So you find that the woman is there so that the, he, she satisfies the requirements. She's just made a profile picture so that the, um, um, uh, what you call the, the application or when these people tender for government, uh, it works. And these are some of the things that we need to, to, start, uh, to start talking about. If we speak about uh, government policy on, on the 30 percent, if you look at what happens in our communities, the people who actually begin to get this 30 percent, it's men. They organize themselves in a violent way. They go to construction sites. Women are not violent. They don't have muscles. They go and fight, and they fight for this 30 percent. And this 30 percent goes to this particular unscrupulous man. In the main, um, thugs who are not respected in our in our communities. And these are some of the things that we we need to speak. But if you look at the other the other side of the coin, who are the breadwinners in our families? Who are who are who who, who looks after these deserted uh, children in the families? It's women. Women are the ones, almost, all, all, almost uh, most of us here were raised by a woman who either was a kitchen girl, who worked somewhere to ensure that all of her children are able to eat at night. So we need to be able, while we pass policies, we must also police those policies to ensure that they are, they are, they are not exploited, to ensure that they are implemented. 
there's another issue that I've I've actually uh, realized, and and it's it's what it's a mistake we make as um, as politicians. To to be honest with you, we we speak of uh, elevating what we call the uh, sex workers, and and to some of us, this is a camouflage to deliberately exclude, the, in particular, black women from real economic activities. And also the biggest beneficiaries of this sex work is men, because these brothels are owned by men. Well, I've seen uh, now in the, in, the, in the mainstream media, and we need to start uh, talking out, that others are even if, uh, elevated to international levels, uh, given roles and everything, as advocates of sex work. How can we be proud of such? Because when you speak about sex work, who are the bouncers there? Who are the owners of, uh, of these brothels? It's men. But why, why are we not speaking about the placing women in the mainstream economy of this country where we are able to make men, where they are able to contribute and make meaningful change? But we want to elevate them and make them look good when they are speaking about sex work. Even, even we go proudly to say, let's rush to parliament and pass laws that are able to extract. So we need to speak out. That is exploitation of women. And any woman who is used as a, as, a, as, a, as a tool or a token to promote such things so that they, they camouflage the real issues where women must be placed in the mainstream economy is a shame to, to, to women in our country. And we're happy that we have the gender commission here, and we hope that, um, and we, we know why it was formed, it must do its work. We hope that it, it, it puts its, its house in order, because the gender commission must be a perfect example of women in leadership. So that no one should have, a, should have any doubt about the gender commission. Reports that we are reading about um, uh, corruption, money, money disappearing, and, 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 and money that is meant for a work that is supposed to combat gender-based violence, money that is made to ensure that it empowers women just going to disappear under the leadership of women in that commission. We need to deal with that because that is what emboldens men. You know, It's like what we experienced during apartheid, uh, the, 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 the whites, who are in charge of this country were saying they found the blacks fighting amongst themselves. When men have private conversation, they speak about leaders not being able to lead, fighting amongst themselves all the time. So this is something that we need to, to deal with. There's something fundamental that Kulumandoda is, is raising, uh, uh, led by Ndade Patrick Shai, that we need to start dealing with. If a woman is raped and goes to a police station, that woman is subjected in the same queue as somebody who's there to, to report the theft of a laptop or a butler. Mm -hmm. We need to start partitioning where so we need to find a way that the women can be able to, to report such crimes without being intimidated, without uh, having to face some of what some of the things that they are facing in police stations. And we know it's a reality. And 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 also. Even the people who, who, are, who are tasked with investigating gender-based violence, even when a woman is not dead at the time, are these people properly trained to be able to follow up the, the leads and all those sort of things? Do we also have mechanisms? And this is what we're going to take to the legislature. It's not what, what we are saying, it's what you are, tell, you are telling us, that we need to also police um, the, the protection orders. We need to follow up on these protection orders, and we need to, to also decisively ensure that we, we establish a court that deals directly with gender-based violence, because the issue is to prevent, so that a man must, be even, must even be ashamed. Anyone who is even tempted to commit any crime against women, they must be a, a, a ashamed to do that. Lastly. And I think uh, 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 and that Patrick, Patrick Shai will agree with us. What we are consuming in the media also plays a big role. I know alcohol plays a role. But if you want to understand um, some of the challenges of this country, you just go to your DSTV, uh, Moja Love, channel uh, 157, where, 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 where you even find some of the TV shows which, which promote patriarchy and which promote the, 
the undermining of women in a very unscrupulous way. We need to also start speaking about those sort of things. And we thought that this will be raised here. But we had all the, the, poor, the viewpoints that have been raised. And we are, we are more than emboldened and committed to ensure that this does not just become a talk show, that we are going to actually move from talk to action, that we are going to move from just talk to ensuring that we sponsor legislation that responds to this, that we are going to start um, uh, invoke a, a pushing government to go and support men who are at the cutting edge, who are where the tire meets with the tire, men who are who are actually co soccer coaches, who are actually working in communities, that we actually support them. Because those are people who are assisting us in ensuring that we keep the, the, the spread of this um, uh, gender-based violence. Thank you very much, and thanks, and that the calling hands. Thank you, Honorable Makubela. Uh, in our midst, we have Honorable, uh, there's uh, Honorable uh, Kanyani, your contribution as a closing remark? Yeah, uh, I won't really be long. And uh, I take it that the chairperson of the men's forum at the legislature is laid a way forward. He has put all those issues together. And I must say, this is our second phase. We had this kind of a platform where we got all the men at the legislature talking to themselves. So for now, we wanted to get views from outside so that we become more responsive to what really come from various institutions. And uh, your recommendations, the issues that you have raised, I take it almost all of us here, those who are listening, those who are following us through the YouTube, we are all educated. And now based on the issues that you have raised, I'm telling you, we are taking them very serious and then we're going to elicit a program that is very, will be very practical and will also inform you and taking you along with the issues that we have just raised. And in a nutshell, all the issues that have been raised, it is more of building sustainable communities, sustainable households, comprehensive social uh, uh, security systems. And then we'll make sure that as the legislature, we become responsive and then we embrace all the issues that have been raised. And I must say, without calling you name by name, we are really happy. And then we welcome all the views and rest assured, we'll really take them forward. And on that note, uh, Colin, I want to thank everybody. And we're saying even tomorrow, when we call you, make sure that you respond promptly. And then thank you very much. To all the panelists, thank you very much for contributing <laughs> to this call. And can, hello. can I make a plea with the Honorable Deputy Chair Kanyane on the issue of consent? He, uh, please, consent, we need to discuss the issue because if at the legislature level there's an issue on what is find us consent. We cannot allow that. I want to say on the record, consent is no, is no, it's not abstract. We must take this further. If we need to have another discussion in this, on this platform to deal with the issue of consent, to deal with the uh, legalities around consent, the age, uh, uh, sobriety, someone who is drunk can never consent. Many men, they think that getting someone drunk and making them take alcohol is a, is, and then you have sexual intercourse is a consent. So that we can legislation is 16. But if you are below 16, between 12 and 16, there are some nuances there. But I want to say uh, issues of uh, power, issues of if you are the one who has money, if you are in the workplace and you have the authority, this is issues that change the dynamic of power and the likelihood of you consenting to something you don't want to do. And you are actually at fault as the one who has the power and the authority. So let's discuss this. Let's share about this issue of consent. Sure. Please call us back here. We will come. But consent, no is no. There's no absolute issue there. I'm sorry, Honorable Member. I'm most terrified of that. Thank you very much. And uh, say, and, and, all I can say is... Thank you um, very much. I, I think uh, it, it, it's a well accepted. That's a very good uh, input. I was just putting it so that we can really stress it. No <laughs> is no. Yes, Honorable, yes. Honorable Kanyani. 
I think now I'll use the powers of the legislature. Honorable <laughs> Kanyani, you are out of order. <laughs> now, uh, to the panelists, uh, I think we can do better in the next session. And uh, this one came out very well because of what we wanted to achieve was let's have an open discussion without having to put protocol as in giving you a specific topic. But if you had a topic that directs us like issues like which law protects citizens from gender-based violence in South Africa would have been specific on a particular topic. But I'd, I'd love the way it went to us impromptu and I, I like all the contribution and I would love also to give the closing remarks to everybody, but because of the protocol doesn't allow now. All I can do is to acknowledge the contribution and say, may the Lord bless you as panelists and add more enthusiasm in your capabilities. Honorable, uh, for, Honorable Fasani, I know you'd like to close the whole session, but because of time, we cannot do that. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Till the next time, Aluta Continua. Uh, thank you very much and thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Colenans. Hola. Thank Hola. you. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.